Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's so good to see you all. So good to see you all tonight. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Nigeria Bailey, and I am the associate producer for NJ Pax Community Engagement. I'm so excited to be with you all this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You could have been anywhere else, but you decided to be with us tonight. And so we're grateful that you uh, chose to be with us on tonight. Uh, I'm excited tonight to uh, present this panel in partnership with North History Society, Forgotten North Riots. We're gonna hear from some amazing panelists on tonight. This is being recorded, and so you'll be able to catch the replay later uh, on our YouTube channel. Please go and subscribe um, uh, on YouTube. Subscribe to New Jersey Performing Arts Center's YouTube channel so you can see all of the offerings that we have to share in JPAC in your living room. We've been virtual now for 12 months. We've been programming for uh, uh, the community um, and having amazing things for every uh, everyone from every walk of life. We have something for children, for adults, everyone. And so we encourage you to go and find out, go to njpack.org and you'll see in your living room to see all of the offerings that we have. Um, and so tonight's program, we wanna just say thank you, a special thank you to our sponsors, ADP, who is the official community engagement partner of NJPAC. We're so excited um, and thankful for, the, for their sponsorship. And also we wanna give a special thank you to our North History Society series sponsor, Warren Grover. So we thank, uh, we're just so thankful for those sponsors. They make these programs happen. And so, let us get on with our program tonight. I want to introduce to you uh, Tim Chris, who is with the North History Society. Hey, Tim, uh, we're so grateful for you being here today. Please uh, let us know uh, who's gonna be with us on tonight and I turn everything over to you. Great, thanks Najia. We're really grateful to um, uh, NJ Pack for co-sponsoring this program with us. And uh, we're really grateful as well to John Schreiber and, and Donna Kuhn Walker and you and the entire NJPAC team for all that you do for the uh, newer community. Um, tonight's program is, uh, as the title of Forgotten Newark Riots, 19, uh, 1834, 1854, and 1917. You know, mob action has been very much in the news recently, but we sometimes forget how deep a history riots and mob action has uh, in the United States. Um, for tonight's program, we've adopted for our title, uh, the late Clement Price, Price's phrase, forgotten riots for the title of our program, because that's a phrase that he used in his um, uh, history of Newark class at, the, uh, at Rutgers Newark. And Clem understood that riots and mob actions can provide a window into the ideologies and stresses at play in a community. And riots have occurred periodically in Newark's uh, long history, certainly going back to the 18th century. Uh, but tonight our panelists will discuss just three of them. Um, and I wanna make sure, uh, yes, they're all here. So to start, um, Noel Lorraine Williams will describe how a mob of, of white Newarkers uh, rushed Fourth Presbyterian Church in 1834 when the minister invited uh, a black preacher to, uh, to uh, share his pulpit. Noel is an artist and historian who lives and works in Newark. She earned her master's degree in American studies from Rutgers Newark, and she is currently doing research um, and in uh, organizing programs about the black community in Newark in the 19th century. After Noel, uh, Father Augustine Curley will talk about the anti-immigrant rally of Know Nothing Party adherents uh, that led to two deaths and damage uh, to St. Mary's Catholic Church in Newark in 1854. 
Father Augustine is a Benedictine monk. He serves as the prior and archivist at Newark Abbey, and he's also taught at St. Benedict's uh, Prep for decades. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD in philosophy at Boston College. And our final panelist will be uh, George Robb, who will discuss how a dispute about a dice game uh, led to a race riot, so-called, uh, in the Hill section in 1917. Uh, George is professor of history at William Patterson University, and like our other two speakers, a resident of Newark. Uh, he earned his PhD in history at Northwestern University, and he's currently working on a book about Newark uh, during World War I. Please note your questions as we go along using the chat function or the Q&A tab on your Zoom screen. And we'll put the, uh, your questions and comments to our panelists during our Q&A discussion at the end. So let's get started. Uh, Noelle? Oh, great. Thank you, Tim, for that generous introduction. And hello to everyone in Newark and beyond. I'm so happy to be here this evening to discuss this topic. So I'll start off by opening up my slides. And so basically um, the research for this, I started um, as a part of my project, Black Power 19th Century. And today the topic of this talk is unveiling Newark's 1834 riot against black freedom and also visualizing black activism. So why rebellion? Um, my interest in rebellion and liberation empowers my activist, artistic and research practice, which is centered in presenting African-American expressive culture and history as a portal to understand the multiplicity of ways American identity has been defined. So one of the um, outputs of this is the exhibition, um, the virtual multimedia exhibition, um, which you all saw in the entry slides um, called Black Power, 19th Century, Newark's First African-American Rebellion. Um, and you can visit the virtual multimedia exhibition at um, blackpower19thcentury.com. So many thanks to the sponsors who are sponsoring this talk this evening, but a special thanks to the New Jersey Historical Commission um, who funded the fabrication of the virtual and in-house exhibition, which will come to New York Public Library in April. And many thanks to the New York Public Library. So our contemporary ideas of rioting and rebellion are often influenced by race, gender, sexuality, and the economic class of the viewers, storytellers, and participants. So for example, even if we look at the Stonewall Rebellion, um, here's an article from the first, um, during when the Stonewall Rebellion happened in New York at an LGBTQ bar. Um, and people fought back, the group of folks um, fought back against police brutality there. Um, the um, title of the article says, homo nest raided, queen bees are stinging mad. Um, we also see an image of uh, Marsha P. Johnson, um, an Elizabeth, New Jersey native, who was one of the leaders in the um, rebellion there. So even as people think about rioting, it has a gender, economic class and sexuality uh, perspective. So looking at um, Newark, we see for many years that the 1967 rebellion in Newark, which was sparked by the rumored murder of a black taxi cab driver by Newark police was called rioting versus a rebellion, even though people were angry about the potential murder of a taxi cab driver, right? His human rights. Um, so we see an article here from Durham Morning Herald that warns residents about the possible rioting similar to Newark in response to the conditions in Durham. We also see images from the Newark rebellion or riot. There are more popular images of that than of people being angry than necessarily the violence 
of the police officers and the National Guard, as we can see in the bottom. Um, as many of you all know, Eloise Spellman, a mother of eight, was killed by a National Guard person while looking out the window. So while contemporary writing by whites about citizenship and American rights often has ties to white supremacy and resistance against black freedom. And we see this most recently in the um, storming and the rioting of the Capitol on January 6th, where a supporter of President Donald Trump carries a Confederate battle flag. Um, we also see that saw in the Charlottesville car attack where a white supremacist um, basically burrowed through and killed two people and injuring eight during a protest around um, people being angry about the Ku Klux Klan, um, a group historically tied to the murder and um, violence against African Americans, um, Jewish people, and other immigrants. So Newark's 1967 rebellion is often perceived to be the earliest major public display of Black rebellion in Newark. History sources rarely include Newark's African-American history, though Blacks have lived, worked, and made community here since the 1700s. Images of Blacks during the 18th and 19th century often have a hidden in plain sight quality, like this image of Newark's first Black fireman, courtesy of the Newark Museum of Art, or even the burial ground at NJ Pack, which has which holds a marker um, that has a name of people who were buried on the campus of um, NJ Pack, including 30 graves of the enslaved and free blacks here in Newark. So as I began my research, um, it was almost like looking into a vacuum. So when I did a Google search, the first time I read about the Reverend Weeks riot um, in the 19th century, it was basically sandwiched, as you see, in between a whole bunch of facts, right? So uh, basically a riot, uh, a racist riot was sandwiched in between the first St. Patrick's Day is celebrated and Cedar Street is born and an abolition riot occurs in Newark. The fourth Presbyterian church is wrecked inside and the window smashed by a mob of 1000 men. I pause just so that those of us from Newark can think of the intersection on Washington near Raymond Boulevard and imagine a thousand men tearing the curtains off of the church, knocking over benches. But what learning about this riot did was it was my first clue about organized resistance against black freedom in Newark. So in the 1830s, there were several churches that left Newark's original church to create their new congregations. Fourth Presbyterian, where Reverend Weeks was, was one of the first of the era. Another was First African Presbyterian Plain Street Colored Church. It was established by Blacks who left Old First, um, which is pictured to the left, um, right of this text, um, that still is on Broad Street. Um, the African Americans left that church due to the segregation and rape racism within the church. So Reverend Weeks was installed in 1832 as the pastor of Fourth Presbyterian. While it's unclear, while it is unclear when the expectation started where blacks were expected to stand by windows as was the case at Old First New York's founding church, one thing is clear is that by the early 1800s, many white churches were instituting this practice. These segregated sections were so important and so prolific that they actually had a name called African pews or nigger corners in various churches in the North, including Newark and Elizabeth. For example, as Siloan Presbyterian in Elizabeth, it traced its origins to its own first Presbyterian church there, where the older church originally relegated black congregants to its balcony. The internationally known AME church and later on its spin-off church, AME Zion, were founded in Philadelphia in 1816 
again, in resistance to segregated seating. We do not know the seating arrangement at Fourth Presbyterian. However, evidence in the records indicate that Fourth Presbyterian was either a primarily white church or observed a segregated seating pattern. But that would soon change in 1834 with Reverend William R. Weeks' decision to bring a black man to church and sit him in a row with his wife. To the right of this document, you can see a plaque that is at 13th Avenue in Wycliffe Street, which marks the African Americans who left Old First Church due to segregation and racism at the church. So we see this article right at Newark. We learn with deep regret that the evil example of the city has extended to Newark. We are informed that Mr. Weeks of the Fourth Presbyterian Church in that town introduced a colored preacher into his pulpit on Friday night, in consequence of which a mob rushed into the church and after driving out the congregation committed some depredations upon the building. It was found necessary for the safety of the colored man to convey him to the prison. So we're introduced to a couple of ideas here. Uh, first, I would like to note that the image below is from a riot in Hoboken. Um, it's not for Newark. There aren't any surviving images that we know of to date that have um, any images of Fourth Presbyterian Church or any depictions of the riot. Um, we also learn that it actually was a colored preacher um, who was invited to the church. Um, and we also finally understand that this man was conveyed to a prison. So even though the white mob took over the church, it was the black man who had to stay in the common jail. While Reverend Weeks was a member um, of the anti American anti slavery society in New Jersey chapter. And though it was integrated and had some radical members, the organization was not a radical one. And though Weeks was anti slavery, he was not either. So for example, in the article to the right, when the society was split over the question of whether women have the right of originating debating and voting on questions which come up before said society and are eligible to its various office, Weeks actually voted nay. So he wasn't considered to be a radical. Um, so he was actually forced to make a statement about his beliefs um, about integration. So he wrote, I am no advocate for the amalgamation of colors. Um, in the mid 19th century, the word was commonly employed in the United States to describe the intermarriage of the white and the Negro race. Um, he goes on to say that I believe that God in making men of different colors has sufficiently indicated the duty to us of keeping them separate and of allowing no intermarriages between them. And he ends it defiantly, I have not time for further explanations. So as we continue to look at this riot at Reverend Weeks Church, we note that Newark's 1834 riot was not an anomaly. So it wasn't something that just happened out of the blue. It was actually preceded by an anti-abolition riot in New York days a couple of um, days earlier. Um, actually, Arthur Tepan, one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, had brought Samuel Cornish, um, who would later become a pastor at, at the Newark Plain Street Colored Church, and who was the co-founder of this nation's first African-American newspaper, um, brought Samuel Cornish to the church. Um, and then as well as hosting anti-slavery talks, that ch church um, was destroyed. Um, whole sections of the neighborhoods were destroyed in New York in 1834. And these riots are actually called the Foran Riot or the Tapan Riot. Um, though many people often, like today, say that these tensions originated out of people, white people who felt disenfranchised and not a part of the economic system in New York and thus took it out on African Americans, um, that was not true. So when the buildings, photo, and histories are gone, how do we visualize these stories of rebellion? And how do we connect the history of riots with today? 
So here, what I did is I decided to reimagine the Reverend Weeks riot. Um, we go to Washington Street. Um, I created a church that's actually the church that's closer to Central Avenue. And as a monument, almost like a ghostly monument. And what I decided to do was connect some of our most visceral images of white violence during the civil rights movement. Because one of the things this exhibition does is it connects the violence and the liberation of the 1800s to the 1960s and a little bit to today. And then we see the black pastor floating up to the sky. So it's important also in this exhibition and with Reverend Weeks' example that we present the writing art and activist organizing practices of these early change makers. So it's important for us to share the comments of Reverend Weeks, share the work that people were doing in the community and share their conflicts. So their challenges and their most radical visions. Um, I was going to share this video, but unfortunately we're running out of time for this segment, segment, but I would like to encourage you all to please visit the virtual exhibition. There you can hear the actual words of the people that Reverend, the story of Reverend Weeks and the riot there brought us to, so that we see that instead of it being this random occurrence of violence in York, that we see this resistance around African Americans who were working to create better lives for themselves. Please, as we indicated earlier, join us for a talk this Saturday on free black communities, the Underground Railroad and slavery, telling and researching the stories. And thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay, I have to, uh, very nice. Well, I have to say that you're, uh, my uh, PowerPoint presentation is going to be a little, a little tamer than yours, but I think it'll give people something to look at while I'm speaking. And let me. Uh, Great. There we go. One of the most serious attacks, incidents of nativist violence in New Jersey took place on September 5th, 1854, when a number of lodges of the American Protestant Association joined Newark City Lodge number four to celebrate the anniversary of the first sitting of the American Congress. As the parade passed the small wooden Catholic church at the corner of Shipman and William Streets, the marchers and the onlookers engaged in some taunts and some stone throwing and things escalated to the point that the church was destroyed. The attack was widely noted in the press. Much of the reporting, however, was as biased as the attackers. If one were to describe the affair based simply on the newspaper accounts of the days immediately following the incident, one would think that the Irish attacked the orderly group of marchers who were honor bound to defend themselves and who attacked the church only as a response to being attacked. The true story, however, is more complicated. One thing is certain, however, there were no Irish barricaded in the church, and so no shots fired from the church into the crowd. Uh oh. There we go. Nicholas Ballais, a Benedictine monk from Austria, settled in Newark in 1838 to pass to the small but growing community of German speaking Catholics. They were part of a quickly expanding group of German and Irish Catholics whose presence did not sit well with the citizens of Newark who were at the time, for the most part, Protestant descendants of English immigrants, including the descendants of the Puritans who had founded Newark in 1666. Tension between the immigrant Catholics and the old Protestant establishment had already been growing for some time. 
what especially irked the city fathers and their compatriots was the German fondness for beer and the Irish fondness for whiskey, often consumed, horror of horrors, at picnics held on the Lord's Day. When some Germans petitioned the Common Council in 1853 to repeal the ban on Sunday beer drinking, the members were not persuaded. Indeed, in the report of the committee which considered the petition, they expressed their regret at the want of courtesy and respect towards the city authorities and resolved that all police officers of the city are hereby directed to enforce, enforce strictly and rigorously the laws and ordinances for the preservation and tranquility of the Sabbath and for the suppression of the traffic in intoxicating liquors. Now the American Protestant Association was formed in Philadelphia in 1842 in response to this great influx of Irish and German Catholic immigrants. They feared a papal invasion and the loss of democracy if Catholics became a majority in the country. When the Pope sent his representative Gaetano Bedini in 1853 to mediate some disputes that had arisen among American Catholics, many Protestants saw this as the beginning of the papal invasion. In Newark, with the installation of James Roosevelt Bailey as Bishop of the newly established Diocese of Newark in November of 1853, the tension between Catholics and the more rabid Protestants grew more intense. Scheduled speeches in public halls, as well as itinerant street preachers, kept the animosity at a high level. In mid-December of 1853, the Newark Advertiser stated that in the previous weeks, there had been 25 such lectures in Newark. In June of 1854, the Advertiser observed that Protestant street preaching had made riots almost epidemic in Northern cities. Many of Newark's Irish Catholics immigrants found employment at the Halsey and Taylor Tannery located on Shipman Street, just south of the church. Obviously this map is later, but you can see in the, on the left where it says St. Mary's School, that would have been the site of the wooden church that was replaced by the brick church. It would have been moved down the hill from its original site. A number of Irish lived on and just off of William Street between the church and downtown, which is to the bottom of the picture. On September 5th, 1854, the Newark Orange Lodge hosted a gathering of 13 American Protestant, Protestant Association lodges from New York, Brooklyn, Jersey City, and Patterson. Obviously, there's a more recent picture. I didn't, couldn't find any pictures of the march, but it's not much different from what the march would have looked like. Estimates of the size of the group range from 1,500 to 4,000. The Newark Advertiser, a Whig newspaper, described the procession as long and imposing, having numerous bands, banners, and flags interspersed. After describing their dress and banners carried by the crowd, the account continues. Most of those composing the procession carried revolvers and discharged them in the air in return for the cheers and waving of handkerchiefs with which the procession was greeted at various places. The arms were carried partially for this person, purpose and partially for self-defense. The members had experienced molestation before, and so by numerous agreement, the association had prepared themselves to resist attack. The writer concludes, this is their excuse for an act certainly unlawful. The parade followed the prescribed route up to the time for lunch. Then after breaking for lunch, they reassembled about half past three to continue the march. But they did not follow the route that was announced. Instead, supposedly because of the intense heat of the day and possibly because they ate and drank too much at the lunch, they decided to change their route. It just so happened that the new route would take them through an Irish Catholic neighborhood. Leaving Broad Street, they headed up William Street. John Isidell, a German who was visiting Newark at the time and wrote an eyewitness account of the riot, says outright that the marchers set out to destroy the Catholic cathedral, which would have been St. Patrick's, you see in the 
picture down on Washington Street. The band accompanying the marchers played such songs as Boyne Water, The Protestant Boys, and Croppies Lie Down. Taunts along with some rocks were thrown and tensions mounted. Of course, they supposedly weren't going to cause any trouble, but they had all of the anti Catholic songs to play. The New York Times of the next day gave its view of the proceedings. Up to this time, everything had been perfectly tranquil. The members had walked peacefully through all the principal streets of the city, anticipating no assault and provoking none. The instant, however, that this attack was made upon them, the line was broken. The Protestants rushed pell-mell upon the church, forced the doors, beat in the windows, tore up the seats, demolished the altar and emblems, and put the and put the organ very much out of tune so that it can scarcely be an organ again. The Times repeats the allegation that stones were hurled from the crowd and shots fired from inside the church and uses this to explain the vigilance of the assault which was made upon that edifice. The pastor's study was in a room behind the altar. Nicholas Ballais was having dinner with three other clergymen. They went out a back door to escape the marauders. Only the housekeeper, a widow whose grandson, James Ziliax, would later become the first abbot of the Benedictine community, was left in the rooms when the crowd broke in. When one of those who had broken in put a pistol to her breast, she, she said, shoot, I am only a poor woman. He then took an altar cloth and put it over her head. In the meantime, people from the neighborhood answered the alarm that had been sounded and the rioters left hastily, but not before leaving their mark. The New York citizen of Saturday, September 16th, described the destruction. The fences are torn down, the windows and doors shattered, the shrubs about the door crushed and broken. And in the interior, the altar overturned, the sacred utensils and sacerdotal robes strewed about and trampled upon, the organ broke into pieces. The images consisting of a costly Munich figure of the Madonna and crucifix corresponding, together with the pictures, altarpiece, and a splendid holy water font were also destroyed. The local newspapers were divided in their attempts to place the blame. The North Mercury, the organ of the Know Nothing, said that when the head of the procession reached the corner of Shipman and William Streets, they found Shipman Street crowded with Irish Catholics, but the great body of the societies passed without any interruption beyond an occasional shout of derision. As the end of the procession came in view, a stone was hurled from the crowd on the corner of Shipman Street, wounding a, num a member of one of the associations. At the same time, one or two shots were fired from the Catholic Church, occupying the space between Shipman and High Streets. This was the signal for a general riot. And of course, it was the Irish who were to blame. It is to be regretted that any disturbance marred the festivities of the day, but the universal testimony of those who witnessed the affair imputes the blame entirely to the Irish Catholics gathered at the corner of William and Shipman Streets. The North Daily Advertiser on September 6th agreed that the provocation was on the side of the Irish, who they said attacked the procession from the church. Those who made the attack on the procession rushed into the church and discharged stones and pistols from its windows, as several disinterested spectators have asserted in our hearing. This caused a rush from the procession towards the church. The New York Courier and Inquirer of September 6th agreed that the riot was the result of the Irish throwing stones and firing at the crowd from the church, and then went on to blame the ecclesiastical authorities for not controlling those under them. We doubt not that the immediate perpetrators of these attacks are ignorant and bigoted to the last degree, but the very fact that they are thus ignorant and bigoted puts them so much the more under ecclesiastical influence. Why is not this influence more powerfully exercised 
for the prevention of these enormities. But in the issue of September 8th, the advertiser admits that the Catholics were not at fault. And even the Daily Mercury, the Know Nothing organ, admitted on that same date that it was not the Catholics who provoked the riot. We feel that it is incumbent upon us to state that there is nothing in the evidence which goes to show that the attack originated in stones thrown or pistols fired from the Catholic Church. And there is but little question that those making these statements were entirely mistaken. An editorial correspondent of the Boston Pilot, a Catholic newspaper, September 16th, described what he saw. I saw some of the New York Orangemen on their road to Newark. And I do believe that many of them went with the deliberate intention of committing murder, as they did. Most of them were armed and fully prepared to commit the outrages and murders of which they are guilty. While it might be debated whether or not the marchers went intent on murder, the next charge the writer makes against them is certainly legitimate. That they gave the first provocation, marching as usual through the Irish Quarter and doing their utmost to provoke the poor people. That when they failed, they invented an excuse for rushing at the people with loaded pistols and for gutting and sacking the church. The authorities knew or might have known that these orangemen would provoke a riot, but they took no measures to prevent it. The coroner investigated the cause of death of Thomas McCarthy, the Irish Catholic Halsey and Taylor employee, who had received two gunshot wounds. The coroner's jury determined that McCarthy died at the hands of one unknown, even though there were at least a thousand witnesses. The other mortally wounded man, Michael McDermott, had been cut on the shoulder during the riot and died several days later. The September 20th Newark Daily Eagle disputed the postmortem that the term that McDermott died of cholera, while the New York Tribune of that day accepted the determination that he had died of cholera, rejected the determination that he died, accepted the determination that he died of cholera, accepting the coroner's judgment that his wounds were not sufficient to cause death. In its issue of September 16th, the New York Citizen, a Catholic newspaper, expressed the exasperation the editors felt as a result of the riot, since it was, they observed, a repeat of what was seen in Ireland for many years past. Quotation, we have seen so many enterprises of this sort in the north of Ireland that we know their style precisely. One of the July anniversaries comes round, lodges assemble at some central point with drums and fifes playing the Protestant boys. At the rendezvous are the Grand Masters with their sashes and aprons. A beautiful show, as fine as they made the other day in Newark. Procession formed, they walk in lodges, eats eat with its banner of orange or purple and garlands of orange lilies borne high on poles. Most have arms, yeoman muskets or pistols, or ancient swords wedded for the occasion. They arrive at some other town or village, dine in the public houses, drink the glorious, pious, and immortal memory of King William and to hell with the Pope, reform their procession after dinner, and then comes the time for Protestant action. They march through a papist townland, and at every house they stop and play crappies lie down and the boiling water firing a few shots over the house at the same time. The citizen goes on to say that all but one of the New York newspapers blamed the, blamed the riot on the Irish Catholics. The Tribune, it finds, has a more balanced view. The Tribune is the only New York paper we have seen that speaks plainly and manfully upon the subject. The ruining of the church, says the Tribune, was an unprovoked and shameful outrage which reflects great discredit on Newark and on belligerent Protestantism. One local Protestant minister, Robert T.S. Lowell of Christ Episcopal Church wrote to the Daily Advertiser stating that while the teachings of the Roman religion are still to be rejected as a product of ignorance, it was shameful for the Catholics to be attacked in such a matter. And he pledged to support a drive to raise money to rebuild the church. 
And within three years, the church that you now see at the corner of William and Martin Luther King Boulevard, in 18, it was finished in 1857 and was a statement, certainly by the people in the neighborhood, that they weren't about to be scared away. Thank you. Hmm. There we go. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get my slideshow to launch. I can't, yeah, the, the, it's blocking me. Um, oh, sorry, it's blocking me, isn't it? All right, I apologize for that, um, that craziness. So uh, here we are. I am going to discuss an event that took place in Newark in September, 1917. It is certainly a forgotten riot, not mentioned in, in any of the standard Newark histories, even in those histories focusing on African Americans in Newark. But I would um, like to briefly consider the que quest this question first. The term race riot is too vague and inadequate to co cover a whole range of very different events that have taken place across centuries. Today, when people think of race riots, they might remember the explosive events of the 1960s when African Americans rose up against racial discrimination in places like the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles in 1965 or Newark in 1967 or in many American cities in 1968 following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. But a century ago, race riots almost always referred to white mobs attacking black neighborhoods. And the examples given here, and there are many more that could be given, uh, the loss of life and property damage was extensive. The Tulsa riots in 1921 from a hundred years ago, uh, in these riots, white rioters burned down 35 blocks of the African-American business and residential district of Tulsa which was the wealthiest black community in the United States at the time. In July, 1917, a white mob burned down the black neighborhood in East St. Louis, Illinois, making 6,000 people homeless. The rioters killed more than 100 black people, some of them brutally clubbed to death. Um, some historians prefer to call these events race massacres. The violence in East St. Louis led to public protests by African-Americans across the nation. This event was very much in the minds of black Newarkers in 1917. For example, the congregation of Bethany Baptist Church drew up a petition condemning the massacre in East St. Louis, which they sent to President Woodrow Wilson. Um, Newark's 1917 race riot took place two months after the violence in East St. Louis. It took place in the center of the old third ward, which is shaded pink here, 
which was the heart of Newark's Jewish community. The third ward was just west of downtown Newark. Uh, the second and fourth wards on the map would represent uh, the downtown area. Uh, High Street, now Martin Luther King Boulevard, marks the border between the second and the third wards. The third ward was sometimes referred to as the hill because it was on an elevated stretch of land. In 1917, the black population in the predominantly Jewish third ward was relatively small, but had grown substantially in recent years. Um, this, the X on this map marks the scene of the riot um, at the intersection of Montgomery and Broome Streets in the third ward. The riot grew out of a dispute at a dice game in front of the Montgomery Street School, which you can see on the map. Um, today, uh, all that remains of the old neighborhood is the school. This sh sh gives you a sense of the street near the school, where the, the neighborhood where the riot took place. But you can see new housing, pretty nice. It gives no indication of what a rundown slum the neighborhood was like in 1917. Uh, this image gives you a better sense. This is some examples of slum housing in Newark in the early 20th century, not in the Third Ward, but uh, it does give you a sense of what the housing would have looked like at the time. Back to the riot map, to the scene of the riot. This is an insurance map, and the, the pink buildings represent buildings that were built out of brick, the yellow out of wood. So you can see most of the buildings in this neighborhood are built out of wood, which would have been the poorest, most substandard construction um, at this time, right? In the late afternoon on Monday, September 3rd, 1917, about a dozen young men, black and white, were taking part in what was a regular but illegal dice game in front of the school. A dispute arose between two men, one black, one white, over a nickel. Uh, this led to name calling and shoving. The Newark Evening News reported that black people shouted anti-Jewish epithets. Uh, presumably the white rioters used racist slurs, though these, this was not reported in the paper. The black men present chased the white men up Broom's, Broom Street northward towards Clayton Street. You can see that at the top of the map. The whites picked up reinforcements as they ran, and then they chased the black men back uh, to the school. The blacks shouted for help, and black people in the building across from the school at the corner of Montgomery and, 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 and Broome, you can it's pink on the map, um, began to throw uh, bottles and bricks from upper story windows at the white rioters in the streets below. As word spread, more black and white people poured into the streets from buildings nearby. Rioters raided a blacksmith shop um, across Broom Street, uh, um, um, on Broom Street across from the school, grabbing tools, iron bars, and wagon wheel spokes. A police patrolman who heard shouting tried to break up the fighting by swinging his club at the rioters and blowing his whistle for reinforcements. A youth employed at a nearby drugstore also telephoned the police. Three more policemen soon arrived, but the rioters' numbers had swelled to a hundred or more. The police clubbed rioters and shot their pistols in the air in an attempt to break up the riots, but to no avail. The rioters attacked one another with clubs, knives, bricks, and bottles. And the numbers are not clear, but it was certainly more than a hundred people. It could have been as many as 300 people. Eventually, dozens of police arrived by cars from several Newark precincts. Uh, the um, police drove their patrol cars into the crowds to break up um, the rioters. At this point, the white rioters joined forces with the police against the black rioters, and the police sem seemed to welcome this. Black rioters fled uh, or began to flee into buildings along Groom Street. The police pursued, dragging several people out of buildings and hauling them off to jail. Eventually, 15 people were arrested. 12 men and three women, all black. The police, um, uh, four people were lying bleeding in the street, one black man and three white men. They were taken to the city hospital. Uh, luckily, nobody died as a result. Uh, the police imposed an overnight curfew on the neighborhood and they closed all bars within a one mile radius. That night, 150 uh, policemen uh, patrolled the third ward to prevent further violence. The police turned away hundreds of people from other parts of the city who tried to enter the neighborhood. 
Uh, some, no doubt, were coming just for as curious onlook onlookers. Others were probably looking for trouble. The local press covered the riot extensively, though it was not reported on much outside the region. Reporters interviewed people in the Third Ward, um, but they only spoke to white people, though they noted that Black people in the neighborhood um, looked sullen, in their words. One white man interviewed claimed that uh, the Black men in the neighborhood had gotten too cocky and they had to be put in their place. Um, another man said that the problem was with, quote, these Alabama Negroes who would never fit into the neighborhood. I will return to the riot in its aftermath shortly, but I now want to provide some background information to, uh, about local conditions and developments which led to this um, violence in Newark in 1917. Newark had a very old and well-established African-American community, but before the uh, early 20th century, it was relatively small and it was scattered around the city. The great migration of Black families from the rural South swelled Newark's Black population as it did in many other uh, Northern towns. African-Americans fled uh, Jim Crow segregation and lynching in the South for greater freedom and better economic opportunities in the North. As these census figures demonstrate, the Black population of Newark grew in both overall numbers and as a percentage of the city's total population. So in 1900, there were 7,000 Black people in Newark that represented about 2.7% of the population. By 1930, there were 38,000 Black people representing almost 9% uh, of the city's population. The, and the biggest um, change is with the Great Migration after 1915. From 1910 to 1920, Newark's Black population increased by 80%. And from 1920 to 1930, by more than 100%. Uh, black migrants from the South had little trouble finding jobs in Newark, but finding a place to live was another story. Newark already had a tight housing market, but many landlords would not rent to Black people. They were mostly relegated to the worst, most dilapidated housing in the city's poorest central wards. This is a photograph of some Black housing in Newark uh, from the 1940s, where some of this was still in existence. So this, but this does give you a sense of what some of the housing would have been like along Broome and Montgomery streets in 1917. This well-known ethnic map of Newark from 1911 shows where Black Newarkers or some Black Newarkers lived before the Great Migration. Black people could be found in most of the city's wards, though mostly uh, in small pockets. And if you look towards the center, center of the map where it says Jews, and, uh, that's the third ward essentially. But below them, that where you see Negroes and N um, marking where black people lived, that's mostly the second ward uh, in Newark. Um, th uh, that's probably the largest concentration of black people in Newark in the second ward, but only about 20% of the total uh, population. And it, wasn't, it didn't dominate the, the central ward uh, rather the second ward completely, the second ward was very uh, mixed uh, ethnically and racially. These figures from the second and third ward um, shows you how the third ward grows to become the center of Newark's black community during the great migration. The percentages show you the percentage of this ward's population as, for, uh, as part of the total black population of Newark. So for example, in 1900, there were only 470 pe Black people living in the third ward, and that represented 6% of the total Black population of Newark. By 1930, you had 12,000 people, uh, Black people in the third ward, which was almost a third of all the Black people in Newark. Um, I mean, um, the third ward goes essentially from being a Jewish ghetto in 1900 to being an African-American ghetto in the 1930s. And as more Black people move into the neighborhood, Jewish people move out to Wequaic in South Newark or to nearby suburbs. And this shift in populations created tensions that were played out in the 1917 riot. Uh, this uh, map of the riot scene, which I'd shown you earlier, uh, this shows you where Black people lived in the neighborhood. This is data I got from the 1915 New Jersey census. So the places that are colored red, these are 
um, houses, apartment buildings in the neighborhood where black people lived. Uh, the Newark papers refer to this as a colony of colored people in the Third Ward. Another important background issue to the 1917 Newark riots was World War I, which had begun in Europe in 1914 and the United States got involved in the war in 1917. Uh, the war ramped up industrial production in Newark and it closed down immigration from Europe. This created an opening for African-American migrants uh, and workers. And of course, it's a big part of the reason why you had so many uh, African-Americans moving to Northern cities to get jobs in factories, making munitions and things like that. Uh, the government also needed black men in the military as this poster shows, right? The, the colored man is no slacker, but the, the, hypocrisy, the hypocrisy was pretty strong, right? Black men could fight and die for America Indeed, they were compelled to by a military draft, but they were still subject to racist discrimination and violence. And the army was segregated like the rest of American society. This draft registration card shows that recruits were sorted by race. If you see under line 10, there's a place for race and the four racial categories you could choose from were Caucasian, Negro, Mongolian, meaning Asian or Indian. But in addition to line 10 that lists one's race, Note at the bottom left-hand corner, if the person is of African descent, cut off this corner. Black people were counted twice or noted twice on draft registration cards. Here's an example of an actual draft registration card from a black man from Newark, Dorsey Covington. You can see he uh, was born in North Carolina. He moved to, uh, to Newark. He's living on North uh, Fifth Street, just a couple blocks from where I live. But you can notice at the bottom, uh, the corner is cut off to just to make doubly sure that the draft that black people's draft cards did not get mixed up with um, non black people right because the only racial category that really mattered was Negro because only black men were segregated a Chinese American a, a Filipino and Native American they could serve alongside white soldiers. Uh, black men's military service led to greater demands for political and social equality. As more African Americans moved up north, they found greater freedom to vote and to organize uh, politically. Black people in Newark organized local chapters of the NAACP and the Urban League. Uh, these are the dates they were organized in Newark, and this was just a couple of years after they'd been created as national organizations. And these chapters, these groups campaigned for fairness in housing and an end to racial violence. Uh, now let's get back to the Newark race riot of September 3rd, 1917. On the day following the riot, the 15 black Newarkers who had been arrested and held in the city jail were brought before Judge Pilgrim in the municipal court. Pilgrim had only been appointed to his judgeship in 1916 by Mayor Thomas Raymond, a political progressive. To the surprise of many present, Judge Pilgrim expressed consternation that only Black people had been arrested, and he berated the police for this. Pilgrim postponed the hearing for two days, instructing the police to get more witnesses and to bring in some white people who had participated in the riot. Ultimately, the police were unable to bring in other participants or witnesses. So on Thursday, Pilgrim released those who had been arrested on Monday. But on September 4th, Judge Pilgrim did adjudicate one case associated with the riot. On the evening following the riot, the, a police patrol in the third ward arrested these three men engaged in a fight. They were all recent arrivals to Newark. The Quinto brothers worked as junkmen their family had immigrated from Eastern Europe. The census uh, lists their first language as Yiddish. Pittman was a black man. Uh, he'd been born in Florida and he worked as a laborer in Newark. Uh, Pittman claimed that he was on his way home when the Quintos set upon him, cursing him and striking him. The Quintos claimed that they were merely walking along when Pittman lunged at them with a knife. Judge Pilgrim doubted the Quintos story. Quote, I can't believe this colored man attacked the two of you. It was unusual for a judge at this time to take the word of a black man over that of a white man, and in the South, it never happened. Pittman's case was aided by the fact that the Quintos had reputations as troublemakers, and Louis Quinto had appeared before Judge Pilgrim before. 
So Pittman, the black man, was immediately released. Barney Quinto was fined $25, and Louis Quinto was sentenced to a month in jail. Uh, in the aftermath of the riot, the Newark papers downplayed what they called the so-called riot, congratulating themselves that Newark was a racially tolerant uh, city. Uh, an editorial in the Newark Sunday Call concluded that there was no racism in Newark because black and white Newarkers were willing to play dice together in public. That was basically their argument. The, uh, the paper downplayed racial aspects of the riot, emphasizing that the rioters represented the most lawless uh, members of both communities. In other words, Newark didn't have a race problem, it had a class problem. These were low class people from both communities. Uh, black people in Newark didn't doubt that there was racism in the city. And Newark's African-American citizens following the riot decided to organize what was called a silent parade to protest unequal treatment of black people uh, in Newark. The first such silent parade had taken place in New York City on July 28, 1917 to protest the race massacre that had recently taken place in East St. Louis. This is often considered the first national protest by African-Americans uh, in the United States. Um, thousands of African-Americans marched silently down Fifth Avenue in New York to the muffled beat of drums. They carried placards and banners that proclaimed Black people's um, um, contributions to America and that highlighted their grievances. I've not been able to locate any images of the silent parade in Newark, but this image from New York gives you a sense of what it would have looked like. The white women all wore, I mean, the, the uh, Black women all wore white dresses. The men wore their Sunday best and they carried these signs. And you, you can see the one in front, which says the first blood for American independence was shed by a Negro, Crispus Attucks. Um, in Newark on October 4th uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon, 1400 black men and women marched down Broad Street from Lincoln Park to Washington Park. Another 3000 African-Americans lined the parade route. Mayor Thomas Raymond, um, saluted the marchers as they passed City Hall, which was seen as a sign of respect. Among the, uh, among the placards carried by the marchers in Newark are these examples. Wanted decent houses, reasonable rents, wanted political recognition, 6,000 Negro voters in Essex County. We expect New Jersey to give us a square deal, or my favorite, our music is the only American music. Uh, and finally, a banner that stretched all the way across Broad Street proclaimed, all men are created equal. But at the bottom of this banner in red letters was written, if of African descent, tear off this corner, right? From the draft card. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. We'll try to get Noel back and hope that um, um, Augustine joins us as well. Um, okay. And thank you, uh, each of you, for uh, talking about it. I knew about the, uh, the Know Nothing Parade in 1854, but the other two um, incidents were, were new to me. Um, Noel, was, do you know what happened to? Um, Reverend Weeks after this, or uh, or to the uh, the black preacher who was put in the jail for his protection. Okay, so a couple of things. First, uh, Pastor, well, Reverend Weeks continued to pastor Fourth Presbyterian Church, but around 1945, due to health reasons. Um, so about you know 10, 11 years later, due to health reasons, he gave up um, pastoring the church. Um, and the um, Presbytery decided that the church would never really have um, a chance of supporting the gospel independently. So I don't, I don't know what that means, but um, basically the Fourth Presbyterian Church um, was dissolved and people were given notices to go to other places. Now, there's a couple, we're trying to figure out who exactly was the man that came to church with Reverend Weeks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Greg Gudurian at um, the Newark Public Library, he suggested that it's Tom Decker. Um, he was a black barber whose barbershop was located at Commerce and Broad Street. 
Um, I'm not sure if it was Tom Decker because one of the things I've noticed about the articles is that even that though they did go to rush the barber shop, it was not necessarily a barber in all of the articles that, so perhaps since the barber shop was a symbol of black um, economy and black freedom in Newark, they could have um, just chosen the barber shop close to there. I also didn't mention that the crowd also tried to go to Reverend Weeks's house and tear down the house. I think someone was able to like nail the door closed so they weren't able to do that. But you know, the most interesting part of me, part to me of the, all of this is just how, you know, initially the riot read as something that just happened out of the air. And then once we connected to all of the horrible um, transgressions that took place four days earlier in New York, um, it just becomes a part of like a consistent pattern of how to kind of like suffocate calls for black liberation. Well, it seems to be a, a theme for each of the three uh, 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 mob actions is that it's they seem to be tied to larger uh, uh, trends in America or to um, other events um, uh, uh, a little bit before. Um, Father Augustine, there's a question that, about the Irish Protestants. Were they... Um, uh, Ameri born in America, or were they uh, Irish born? I mean, the know nothing uh, nativists uh, tended to be American born, didn't they? Or that's right, and that's where we get. Uh, we're not quite sure, but they seem to be mixed. And it seems to be the case that you, it was all right if you were foreign born as long as you were Protestant. <laughs> you no, know, it's uh, they seem to okay. Well, we'll overlook that. Uh, but but it was interesting I, that the the American the uh, American Protestant Association was founded before what we consider the beginning of the Know Nothing Party, and yet they seem to kind of be uh, fellow travelers, so to speak. Um, so they they were more against all these immigrants coming in with the Pope behind them, as opposed to uh, uh, not wanting any immigrants. So that you think this is this is a larger issue than kind of bringing the um, uh, the orange and green conflict from Ireland um, um, to America. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's um, part of the Orangeman's way of becoming American. Ah, <laughs> known of bashing Catholics. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think all of these talks do raise an interesting point um, that. I've also been thinking a lot about the past couple of years is how does Newark kind of like fall into this pocket of not really being connected to these national events? <laughs> you know, as, as Tim pointed out last week, you know, Newark is rarely thought of as a colonial town slash city. We're rarely like um, connected with these national events, even when, um, it's documented in newspapers and other histories. And so it's fascinating. It's like, is this by design? You know, as George was um, talking about earlier with the newspaper article talking about race relations in Newark, right? And how there's never been any experience of like <laughs> racism, right? So is it that the Newark, um, is it that the Newark machine is kind of creating this kind of benign um, ambivalent um, place in New York or, you know, so that's, that's an interesting question to me when we think about New York history. Um, and this talk brings it up again. And George, you want to comment on that? It's, it's the perennial question about local history and whether it's, it's limited to, you know, isn't this interesting about the place where we live and work? Or is it um, a way to illustrate and understand larger trends or for to understand how those larger trends played out in a in a local area. Hmm. Yeah, I know. And I, I well, I think part of it is just Newark being neglected in national histories and people not looking at what's happening in Newark. But yeah, I think that uh, my talk and the other show that Newark, what's going on in Newark is completely connected. We're so close to New York. We're not that far from Philadelphia. So these, you know, these and I think that's part of what was 
why uh, this incident in Newark got so quickly out of hand. I think black people in Newark were all upset about this recent riot in, in East St. Louis. There had just been a silent parade in New York about it. And it's like, we're not gonna put up with this. We're not gonna let people shove us around or we're gonna fight back or, we're, you know, that this was, you know, that um, this isn't just some little dice game that got out of hand, but it, it's reflecting, you know, tensions between racial communities that were developing all over the country at the time. And, and Beth Zach Cohen raised a question, George, about whether the the white rioters in 1917 were likely Jewish or or oh they were all Jewish. Every that last one of them was Jewish. I mean that was a totally Jewish neighborhood. Oh. Right? The black people were were shouting anti-Jewish epithets at them. You know, interesting. These people who grew up in the rural South had probably never seen a Jew, and they very quickly learned what to call them, and vice versa. Right? I'm sure the Jews were shouting racist slurs at the black people. Right. Uh, and that was part of implicit in what the newspaper was saying, too, making it into a class issue. Uh, it, it wasn't saying, you know, every, I mean, everyone in Newark knew that people, that the third word was Jewish people. The newspapers occasionally referred to the writers as Jewish. They mostly referred to them as white. But I think part of what was implicit in the editorials is, oh, Jewish people, you really think you're better than Black people? You know, mm -hmm. that, that's a waspy mainstream attitude of sort of dismissing uh, both of the groups. Um. And George, there's a couple more questions for you. It, it seems like the numbers of, of people at the silent parade, um, they may have come from more communities than Newark. They came from all over New Jersey. That's a good yeah. they, were the black, were, invited. And were the black churches involved in, in organizing that or? Yeah, I think they probably were because the beginning of the parade were ministers. They said 50 black ministers, and there were, certainly were not 50 black churches in Newark. So they would have been black ministers from churches all over New Jersey who were participating in that. Yeah. Oh. And Dale Cors Colson has a question for you about tracking down that 1917 resolution uh, condemning the violence in St. Louis from Bethany Baptist Church. Yeah, that, that, I found the reference to that in the newspaper, but I can get it to her. <laughs> yeah, I think they may want that for their 150th anniversary exhibit sure. um, this right. coming year. Right. I mean, they uh, sent it to, they sent that letter to Woodrow Wilson. You can imagine how much attention he gave. It. Yeah. I, <laughs> he was such a racist himself. But. And Father Augustine, I mean, how long did it take for the um, Irish Catholic and German Catholic community in, uh, around St. Mary's to kind of, uh, how, how can I say, get their footing and, and, and um, feel that they had a place in Newark and, and weren't um, isolated? Um, well, you know, I think one of the arguments I make is that uh, it was the Civil War which uh, started to turn things around. Uh, there's, a, there's, a tomb, there's a tomb in St. John's Cemetery in Orange to an Irish immigrant and uh, who had died in the Civil War. And uh, it's very hard to read the inscription anymore. But basically the citizens of Orange uh, raised the money to put the monument up to, um, to honor this man who left his native country and fought for his adopted country. So that was the beginning of a change. But then don't forget in the uh, 1890s, you had the American Protective Association. Mm -hmm. came up, and then in the 1920s, you have the Ku Klux Klan. So I think the Civil War begins to change, uh, but I'd say, well, even now you probably don't, you probably still have discrimination. But uh, may, yeah, maybe to connect it, maybe with the uh, the Great Migration, when you had somebody else now to look down upon. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, these are all sobering stories. Um, I don't have any more other uh, uh, questions to pass along, although we've gotten a number of very positive uh, comments. Let me see if there are more over here. Oh, um, uh, someone's commenting that the Orange Order continued, although quite small in Newark until 1968 when they moved their meetings to Kearney. I guess that's Gale. <laughs> and I must admit that my great great grandfather in in Australia was a member of the Protestant Orangemen's Association um, in in um, New South Wales because they carried it from Ireland. Um, the um, 
Uh, Larry Green is asking you, um, Noel, about to elaborate on, on the question that Reverend Weeks was, quote, forced to issue a statement against uh, racial amalgamation. Uh, uh, can you elaborate on that? Okay, um, sure. As, as I expressed um, post, post delivery of the um, paper or discussion, mm. um, uh, Reverend Weeks's house had also been attacked. Um, and so Reverend Weeks, you know, as I indicated, he was not a radical, but through the attack at the church and the fact that it actually continued a little bit that weekend, um, he was forced to give the statement um, to protect himself and protect his family. Um, what's interesting is that I believe it's Louis Tapham in Manhattan, they also have to issue a statement after the um, riots against the church there that go on for four to five days, um, stating that they're not trying to, um, I had it in the, I had to take it out of the slides, but basically that they weren't trying to disrupt government or be um, radicals. They were just fighting this abomination of slavery. Um, but in New York, again, this amalgamation threat was the looming threat. The, it was that, you know, they were often accused anti-slavery folks, even moderate folks like Weeks of wanting their daughters to be marrying and sleeping with black men. And that was the ultimate threat. And in New York, that's what they were calling every single day. They, I, I, I'm reading this book now called The um, Kidnapping Club, you know, and the guy talks about how they would often throw, like there were two bad A words. There's the abolitionists and there are the amalgamators, you know, it's just this, this desire. And so to protect themselves, they had to publish these public statements Otherwise, the violence will continue. Well, certainly Lincoln had to do that into the 1850s and 1860s, didn't he? Nicole, um, um, Noel, I'm sorry. That, um, was, this, was the fact that a black man was going to speak at the church publicized ahead of time? I believe, I believe so. Okay, so that's how the mob was aware of it or that they were prepared or... Okay. Yeah, I mean, I had read... I had read some notes um, about the American Anti-Slavery Society maybe two years ago at the New Jersey Historical Society. Um, but those books are from the later um, American Anti-Slavery Society. But in those notes, I had read that all of the reverends would commit themselves to bringing a Black person to church as kind of like their statement against segregation. But that's later on in the 1840s. So what I'm assuming is that was actually a part of their process earlier on is that they were these men of religion and that what they would do is bring these folks and um, you know, um, bring them as statements against segregation. Now, if we look at this in the bigger scope of things of African-Americans in these nigger pews or African corners, what we start to see as we look at the scholarship is that this was almost like a civil rights movement against segregation um, in the early 1800s. Frederick Douglass even went back and forth during his whole life as to whether to stay in churches where you were segregated, you were forced to stand like at Old First, or you had to um, sit in the basement. Um, or there's even an example in Boston where the Blacks had to sit in the balcony and behind a wall with a slit in it, you know? But we see hundreds of examples over and over again of African-Americans fighting this desegregation either by starting their own churches or attempting to buy pews like they did in Boston. Um, and they were eventually driven out of the church. They, their pew was first removed. Then there, were, there was waste dumped in there. It was horrible, but it just shows this long history of how desegregation, you know, um, and the fight against it, um, the different ways African-Americans have worked. I was interested that it was Samuel Cornish who, who preached in, in New York uh, a week or so before this. Yeah, Samuel Cornish was actually the one who accompanied um, Lewis, I apologize, I always say his name wrong, Tapan, um, Lewis Tapan to church. Um, and that's when the accusation started there. 
And when did he first arrive in Newark, Samuel Cornish? I would say that Cornish arrived maybe in the mid, mid to late 30s. He had already moved to Bellevue, Belleville, and he had a house there. He also bought lots of property with some of his um, partners. And then later on, he, after Thomas Hunt, who was actually a part of the American Anti-Slavery Society, he came to pastor at Plain Street Color Church. And in the exhibition, we actually um, shine a light on Samuel Cornish's um, letter to Theodore Freelandheisen about how horrible the colonization movement um, is. Um, it almost so made, he, yeah, it almost made yeah. me wonder whether it was Samuel Cornish who uh, uh, Reverend Weeks invited to uh, preach in his pulpit. But yeah, uh, well, that's kind of dawned on me a little. Mm -hmm. Now that I've seen that the different articles are not necessarily saying that it was a barber, but that they went to a barber shop. So, yeah. um, one more question for you, uh, Noel, and what. Do you know what the, is there any evidence about the attitude of the congregation at Fourth Presbyterian and how they reacted to this? I don't have any evidence yeah. of that. You know, I, I went to the Presbytery records in Philadelphia, um, just trying to understand these various, um, the different ways that the churches would leave Old First, you know, and why, um, like, you know, from, from my perspective, right, as a Black cultural researcher, I was looking to see if, like, with Second Presbyterian, if they left because William Hamilton, he was a racist who led the church there, then eventually moved to the South, right? So I'm like, why did Second, Second Presbyterian do this? Why did Third Presbyterian? And it's very unclear in the Presbytery records. Um, and so, you know, even even I go through the members and look at them to see how closely they're connected to various movements, and it's it's not really clear. Um, I think that uh, I might invite each of you to kind of make a final comment, or or unless you have questions for each other, um, um, uh, Noel, can we start with you? Oh, um, I don't kind of what your the, kind of the key takeaway from all this. Um, I mean, I already expressed my key takeaway. One is the significance of New York history as it relates to national history and national movements. I think, I think in a lot of ways with New York's history, particularly as it deals with race and the way that it's been suppressed and overlooked, is that it helps to make it seem as if certain things only happen in other states, right? So that segregation in churches only happen in the South. Slavery only happened in the South. And so then what we don't see is this like system that's tied to economics um, and culture um, that's all working together to, to manage this American identity. And I'll just quickly say, even, even in New York during their 1834 riots, the way that they quelled the riot in, in, in New York initially before it blew out of hand is they had a black man come out and do a minstrel piece. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And so, it, it just brings all of these things that we've been thinking about for the past 14 months, you know, about who gets to be American, who gets to claim a citizenship, yeah. and what different actions are, are about claiming citizenship, and what different actions do you want people want to label as being antisocial? Uh, Father Augustine, do you? Uh... Yeah, I had um, one thought when we talked about before about North. Uh, being neglected the history. Some, a New Jersey historian at one point either said or I read, and I can't remember who it was that said this. He said, you know, if you're studying Tidewater, Virginia, or Plymouth Plantation, you're doing social history. If you study Newark or, New, or Jersey City or Trenton, you're doing local history. Hmm. Somehow it's kind of looked down upon that New Jersey is hmm. not that important. And yet we show that, that, that a lot of things that happen nationally what happened in New Jersey. So I try to tell our, the, my the history teachers in St. Benedict's, when you're doing nativism, make sure you tell the kids about the attack on St. Mary's Church. Right. You know, you can walk them on the corner and their church is not there anymore, but you can uh, describe it, let them use their imagination. That uh, it's not, you know, when, when, as long as Texas controls the school books. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> right, um, <laughs> right. Um, 
And George, I thought it was Dale Colson. Turns out it's Diane Colson. I have I have copied her information and I'll send it to you for okay. uh, that that resolution from Bethany Baptist Church. Sure. Um, any any um, final comment from you, George? I guess I was thinking, you know, um, the riot at the church was not that far geographically from what I was talking about, and so we can kind of see how um, over the centuries neighborhoods change and you've got different groups coming in and displacing other groups and um, uh, you, you know you see the uh, changing neighborhoods and um, but of course often leads to tensions with old groups you know afraid they're going to be displaced and um, so uh, unfortunately we're seeing you know a lot of history repeating itself. It would be nice if <laughs> these things didn't happen regularly every uh, generation or so. But you know, yeah, I see a lot of continuities in our. Time. A lot of continuity. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, let me just end with a couple of quotes that Richard Camareri has, has passed along as uh, um, the talk about Jewish black combat in 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 1917, the Americanization of Irish and the eternalization of racism toward blacks. He, the two quotes that he had were from the Robert Baron, Robert Baron J. Gould. Uh, I can hire half the working class to kill the other half. Mm -hmm. um, and the second was um, from uh, Franz Fanon. Mm -hmm. uh, Some people become so sick from oppression, they'd rather uh, become their enemy than, uh, than fight them. Mm -hmm. So. I want to thank each of you. I want to thank all the uh, the people who uh, joined us this evening. Another yeah. really good program. Thank you for the work that you you put into this. Our next program um, on April twentieth will um, be Gail Malgreen with an update on on the Newark Archives project, which of course is the source book for much of this uh, work that's being done about Newark. And then in May, May twenty fifth, again with the new uh, NJ Pack. We're going to have a panel uh, presentation about prohibition in Newark, uh, where some of these same issues may come out again. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Good night. Good night.